ready to jump into the message this morning? Well, let's do it. Hebrews chapter 12 and also Judges chapter 6. So if you would find your place there and mark it. I want to preach a standalone message to you today called Overcoming Discouragement. Overcoming Discouragement. How many of you have ever been discouraged? Some of you look like you're discouraged now. <laughs> so anyway, y'all were like, man, where's Dustin at? I like Dustin. So anyway, uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and Judges chapter 6. Let me give a little bit of an intro before I get started. People who have no background in church still have a thought in mind when somebody says the word sin, S-I-N, sin. They may not know what it is, but they've heard the term. So we've all heard the term sin, right? So this teaching kind of has, gone, has sifted into um, Christianity theology, if you will, and it really comes from folklore. But folklore tells us about the seven deadly sins. So since we think we know sin, we usually look for the sins we know, and our radar is fully operational, fully alert, looking for the dangers that are associated with the sins we know as, and here's the seven deadly sins, lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, slothfulness, wrath, envy, and pride. Now, there's subcategories to these, but we all know these, the folklore tells us of the seven deadly sins, and what happens in Christianity is we've kind of adopted these and the subcategories of these, and so we think as long as we don't do these sins, we're okay. Y'all know what I'm talking about? As long as I don't do these deadly seven, I'm, I'm good, you know, but it doesn't matter about the other sin. Well, how many of you know the Bible says all sin is sin? So it don't matter if it's a white lie or it's murder. In the sight of God, sin is sin. So that's the big seven that everybody's always concerned about, and everybody goes, ooh, you know, it's spooky, you know, those seven are deadly. And that's where our minds are focused. But if we focus only on those sins, those seven deadly sins, and those subcategories of those seven, we may be vulnerable to things we're not looking for. We may be vulnerable to things we're not looking for. Are y'all in Hebrews? So I want to look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to look at verse 1. Now, this is a very familiar passage, and you hear this passage read a lot at funerals. I've read it a lot at funerals, and I've hit it from that stance. But I saw this passage in a totally different way, and I picked up on some words in this passage that I never thought of, because our minds immediately go to the funeral message when we hear this, because we've heard it so much in Christianity, especially in the South, in the Bible Belt, that we only concentrate on this very first part. But there's some very big words in here. There's some very good substance here that I want to look at today and focus on. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight. Everybody say every weight. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Is that what it says? And let us run with, and this word is huge, this word is huge, let us run with what? Endurance. endurance. That word is huge in the Bible. You ought to study that word, do a study just on that word in the Bible, endurance. The Bible says those that endure to the end will be saved. Those that endure. So it's endurance. So there's in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, you're going to see military terms, you're going to see sporting terms, uh, this has to do with both endurance, so it means those that endure, endurance, and this is, this is more in the sporting term as a race. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Notice the scripture says, there are, watch this, there are, what's that word, there are weights, everybody shout out weights, that slow us down. Where's Ryan at? Come here for a second. This was in prompt. I just thought of this before service, and I went in our weight room. By the way, we have a weight room. It's 1980s version, but it's a weight room. And this is all I could find. But this is a weight. Now, how many of you know if I'm carrying this weight, I can still preach to you, but I have to admit it's a little difficult. 
Okay, I mean, I, I, I don't want to preach to you like this because I'm aware that there's something on my arm, right? It's slowing me down. It's not, I'm not going to be in, in my rhythm a little bit because I'm carrying a weight. Everybody shout out weight. And how many of you know, in our lives as believers, we're so focused on sin, we don't worry about, we don't worry about weights, Okay? We're always looking at the sin, but we're not concentrated that there are weights. This is what the scripture says. There are weights that slow us down. How many of you know there's all kinds of weights? Marriage. Marriage is a weight sometimes, right? Sometimes our children bring weights, right? Sometimes our jobs are weights. Now, if I had time and, and would have thought about this before service, I would have brought out a bunch of weights and we'd have just kept stacking them up and naming them because there's all kinds of weights. The Bible says these weights slow us down. And so there's all this stress and there's all these things that happen in our life, marriage, children, uh, finances, job. How many of you know COVID is a, it's a huge, it's been a thorn in my side since the day I heard about it. <laughs> Weight, it's a big weight. How about this weight? An election. So we have all of these weights. How many of you know when, you're, when your kids want to watch the debate? <laughs> and there's all of these weights that we have in life. That What, what does the Bible say? What do they do? They what? They slow us down. So it says here, the weights that slow us down, and there are sins that easily, what's the word? Trip us up. And so here's where I went with this, and I don't know where to put this, but I'm going to put it here. So that means I can be very diligent about the sins, and yet I may be oblivious to the weights, the things that slow us down. Okay? So for a believer, we're really concerned, and, and it's obvious about the sin, but we don't concentrate on the weights. Okay? So we know about the sin, but let me ask you a question. What about the weights? What about the things in our life that weigh us down and they slow us down according to the Scripture? So listen to me, OCC. If you and I are going to run this race of endurance that, tell, that the Bible talks about, it uses a sporting term, run the race, all the time. Paul talks about a race. To run the race. If we're going to run this race of endurance that God has set before us, we must strip off every weight that threatens to take us out of the race. We must... Look at that word. That we must strip it off. Strip off every weight. How many of you know when you, when you uh, take duct tape, and if you're a man especially, and you've got a lot of hair, and you rip it off, it hurts. Right? It hurts. You ever had your face waxed? No, y'all didn't, because y'all just looking at me. So you tear it off, or your, whatever. It hurts, right? And so sometimes when... When we take these weights, sometimes it hurts. And I'm just going to tell you, we have to decide which weights we want in our life. And I'm going to tell you, there's weights that we can get rid of. We don't have to do everything. And there are things that slow us down, and we've got to learn to get rid of the weights, some of the stress, some of the things that are slowing us down. We've got to learn to strip that weight off. Every weight that threatens to take us out of the race. We have to think that way. Now, there are many weights, but today I want to focus on one weight, the entire message. And I want to talk about the weight of discouragement. The weight of discouragement. Discouragement is the arch enemy of encouragement. Discouragement is the arch enemy of encouragement. Discouragement is not a sin, so... Because it's not a sin, believers don't talk much about it. But discouragement can weigh so heavily on, a, on your Christian race that it can have a similar effect as though it were sin. Discouragement is damaging because, listen to the wording here, it drains your faith. Okay? Notice the words. Drains your faith. Now, I'm very familiar with that word drain, and we all are for that matter, because we all talk about, man, I'm drained. 
I'm just so tired. I know that word. Drained. Um, for me, what I'm doing right now, and you'd have to do this to even have a, any clue of what I'm talking about, but when you, do, when you do this right here, it drains you because you're pouring out. And how many of you know, if you just pour out, pour out, pour out, pour out, and you never pour in, it'll drain you. So that's what Pastor Jay's been doing. I've been getting replenished. I've been getting some substance back in me because for two years, I've been drained. Okay? So God is pouring back into me. And so what happens is discouragement comes in. And here's the thing with discouragement. Discouragement is kryptonite to your faith. Y'all would have to know about Superman to know what that means. And the Bible says, watch this, but the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. And listen, discouragement comes to drain your faith. Y'all with me? And the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. Discouragement doesn't just sit on the top of a person. It seeps into the very core of our soul. Discouragement affects how you think, how you feel, and discouragement will mess with your will to go on. Amen, somebody. So we have to be vigilant to prepare and to prevent discouragement from preventing us to experience the miracles that God wants to perform in our life. We have to be aware of it. We have to, I'm going to use a word, this word is huge. We have to be on guard for discouragement. We have to be on guard for discouragement. When you leave your house, do you lock the door? Okay, Billy does, y'all don't. Where do y'all live, by the way? I'm going to come over and rob the place. Now, so when you leave your house, you lock the door, right? Why? Because you don't want someone coming to your house while you're gone. You don't want to find someone has sneaked in the back door as you went out the front door. Am I right? This, this illustration is huge. I know it seems simple and simplistic, but it's huge. This is what the enemy comes to do. Okay? What did Jesus say in John 10, 10? He said the thief comes to do three things. What are they? Steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. The thief comes. So Jesus said he was a thief. Well, what does thieves do? They come through the back door while you go out the front door. I mean, you know, a thief doesn't play fair. A thief doesn't worry about your furniture or your carpet or breaking your window, do they? Now, the thief comes in any way they can find a way into your home, and that's what the enemy does. He finds a way to come into your home, and even if he can just plant discouragement... He knows that it's a weight. Remember what Hebrews says. He knows that discouragement is a weight. So what's he trying to do? He's trying to slow you down. He's also trying to trip you up. Because once you get weighed down, and once you get discouraged, probably the next step is sin. So he's trying to weave his way into your home, into your life. My dad used to say it like this. The devil will look for the person. Now watch my wording. Watch my wording. Be careful with the wording. The devil will come and look for the weakest person at that time in your home, whoever's spiritually the weakest. It doesn't mean they're weak spiritually. It just means at that time, they're weak. They're discouraged. And the enemy comes into your home to find that discouraged person in your home, the weakest at that moment. doesn't mean they're weak. It just means at that moment they were weak. And he comes in, and all he needs is a door. So all he needs is a little discouragement to work with. And so he'll come into your house. And all he needs is a crack, and he'll put his foot through the door, and he comes in to your house. So he's coming in the back door while you went out the front door. And he comes into your home, and he starts planting these seeds, and before you know it, you're discouraged. And it could be a whole facet of ways that he comes into your home. It could be through your children. It could be through a spouse. It could be through a television program. It could be through the music that you listen to. Y'all don't like this preaching. <laughs> but it could, he comes in in all kinds of ways, and he plants seeds right here. He plants seeds of discouragement, and that's why I use the word guard. Everybody shout out guard. You've got to be on your toes. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to be ready. That's a military term. You've got to be ready. You've got to be on guard. You've got to be looking for the enemy to come into your house because he's going to try to come through the back door as you're going out the front door. 
Discouragement is that way. Discouragement will come into your house, into your life, and it will absolutely surprise you and take you down, and you're going, what in the world just happened to me? What is this? And so, as I was thinking about discouragement, my mind went to Judges chapter 6. Are y'all, have y'all, are y'all in Judges? Have y'all found Judges yet? It's over in the Old Testament. Judges chapter 6. And there's a group of people. Let me give you a little context, and then I'm going to read a scripture, some multiple scriptures here in Judges chapter 6, multiple verses. But there are a group of people here called the Midianites, and these are the Israelites' enemies. So if you know anything about the Bible, you know the Israelites are symbolic of the church. They're, they're re- they represent us. And the Midianites are the enemy. Well, how many of you know now, after Jesus, the Bible says in the New Testament that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers of darkness and high places. So our fight is not against people. Amen. So there's not necessarily a group of Midianites that we're fighting like they were in the Old Testament, but now our fight is a spiritual fight. And so there's this group of people, they're the Midianites, so that represents the enemy, the thief we talked about a moment ago. That's the Midianites, and the Israelites represent the church. And at this time, the Midianites were very strong, and the Israelites were not that strong. And the Midianites would come every time the Israelites' crops were ready to be harvested, And they would come and take their crops, take their livestock, watch this, strip the land bare, and there was nothing for them to eat. That's what the enemy wants to do in your life. If you're a note taker, you ought to write this down. Discouragement wants to starve encouragement. Discouragement wants to starve encouragement. Discouragement, write this down. Discouragement is actively working on your encouragement. Discouragement is actively working on your encouragement. So I want you to hear the story today in Judges chapter 6, the story of Gideon. How many of you have heard the name Gideon? Okay, five people. Praise God. (laughs) You are a tough crowd today. I think I'm going to go back home and rest. (laughs) He was a man that was tired of the enemy stealing. Now, I don't know about you, but me like Gideon, I'm tired of the enemy stealing. I'm tired of the enemy taken from the church, and I don't think we have to give up. I think we have to find ways to combat that. And I think we got to be smarter. Have you ever heard that phrase, work smarter, not harder? So I think we've got to be smarter. And I believe that God has gifted us as the people of God because our God is creative. He created the world, amen? And I believe all that he created is good because he said it was good, and he is the ultimate creator. Well, if we're believers and we're made in the image of God, we ought to be creators, And we ought to be creative. And I think we need to be creative to combat what the enemy is trying to do, which is steal, kill, and destroy, right? Peter said he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we've got to be vigilant. We've got to combat that. And we've got to be creative to combat what the enemy's doing. So that's really what I've been doing in my life. That's what we've been doing. We've been creative to say this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the weights. We're going to put them to the side. We're going to download, we're going to get all the weights off, and we're going to regroup. That's what we're doing. Because we want to be ready for whatever the, whatever, whatever the Lord has for us, and we know that we can't be slowed down and tripped up. Amen. Gideon, listen, so this is Gideon. Gideon wasn't asking for something wrong. He wanted to feed his family, and he takes the harvested wheat out of the field, and he hides it, and under the cover of darkness, he takes the wheat he has to the wine press. Again, I'm saying this for a reason. Under the cover of darkness, he's going to thresh wheat so he will have grain to make bread. While he's in the wine press threshing wheat, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and this is where I want to pick up the story. This is Judges chapter 6. Verse 12, watch the wording. The angel said here, appeared to him and said, Mighty hero. Everybody shout out, mighty hero. hero. The Lord is with you. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever had one of those situations where you go, are you talking to me? (laughs) Did you just call me a hero? Because I feel like a zero. So Gideon starts explaining. This is what we do. We love to explain things away. We love to explain things. He's explaining why he's threshing wheat inside a wine press. Notice the angel said in present tense, not past tense or future tense, in present tense, 
You are a mighty hero. So I have a question for you. What do you do when the Lord calls you something you can't see in yourself? What do you do when the Lord calls you something that you can't see? What do you do when God says something to you and you go, uh, me? You talking to me? Hero, watch this, Hero is the furthest thing from Gideon's mind. He had moved his wheat out of the field so nobody can see it. He's hiding from the enemy under the cover of darkness. He is now snuck into a wine press where they brought whole grapes to put them in a press and they crushed them until they got the juice and then it turned into wine eventually. And he's trying to feed his family. Did I say he was hiding under the cover of darkness? He's resorted to hiding far from the wheat field, trying to get enough just to make some bread to feed his family. And this clueless angel appears to him and says, you are a mighty hero. I think about that. He's hiding. He's scared. He just wants to eat and feed his family. He's hiding in a wine press and the devil co- or the angel comes and says, you're a hero. He's like, what are you talking about? You're a mighty hero. He didn't feel like a hero. I promise you, he didn't look like a hero. In fact, I don't even know if Gideon had a hero to compare to. I don't know if the man knew a hero. But God looked at him and said, you're a hero. You need to know, God will call you what you will be on his own good credit. Who you will be, what you will be, who you can be, what he sees you going toward. He, he, will say, he will say in something, he'll say something about you. You don't even believe about yourself. Can I hear an amen? amen? Gideon was speaking to God about his past, and God was trying to talk to Gideon about his future. And here's some advice. If you and, if you and God are talking, make sure you're saying what God is saying, not what you're saying or what somebody else is saying. Make sure you're repeating what God said, not what you said, not what somebody else said. Come on, church. God called him a mighty man, a mighty hero, and he went, I don't know who you're talking to, but it can't be me. I mean, I'm not a hero. Listen to me, OCC. Sometimes God wants to talk to us about tomorrow, and we're hung up on yesterday. That's some really good preaching, Pastor Jay. (laughs) He wants to talk to us about where we're going, and we want to talk to him about where we've been. He wants to talk to us about a battle plan to win the war, and we're talking about which hospital we're going to go to and which one would be the best one when we get hit. I'm having a blast. (laughs) Are y'all listening to me this morning? God's trying to tell us about winning the battle, and we're trying to figure out which hospital to go to and who has the best doctors. (laughs) Doctor in Little Rock, he's the best. You ought to go see him. Come on, church. We're believers. Listen to this. God comes to encourage us. Satan comes to discourage us. So if you not know God is bringing encouragement and Satan is bringing discouragement, it seems like that would be an easy choice. But I don't know if it is. But if you're like me, I'm talking about me, if you're like me, you're hung up on stupid. Yeah, I said me, I get hung up on stupid. All I see and all you see is the darkness, just seeing the hard part, and God found Gideon working in an unexpected place to get enough bread to feed his family. Oh, I wish I had time to, you, to talk to you today about unexpected places. I could preach for an hour on unexpected places. Things that you never saw coming. You're trying to live for God in an unexpected place. You're trying to live for God in something that you did not know was going to be in your pathway. Living for God, holding on by a fingernail, just barely making it. And God comes to the middle of your unexpected place. And you don't think anybody knows where that unexpected place is. But God shows up because he knows where the unexpected place is. Can I hear an amen? And God shows up and says, you're a hero. God says, you mighty woman, you mighty man of God. Gideon's discouragement was so great. Listen to this. He couldn't even recognize the encourager from heaven. Because there is a discouragement so deep, it can blind you to the miraculous. There is a discouragement that goes so far into your soul that you say you don't have the will to go on and you've given up hope. 
But the thing is, you look people dead in the eye and you say, no, I haven't. But your actions show you have. God could send you an angel, but if your discouragement is blinding you, then you won't recognize him. It could be an angel of the Lord and you see it as just somebody else coming to take your time. See, God was telling Gideon about what he would be, but he couldn't see it. So I want to look at verse 13 of Judges chapter 6. Can we throw that up there? Let's read this. He said, Sir, Sir Gideon replied, he's talking back to the angel, If the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? And where are the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites? Now, before we get on Gideon's case, this sounds like us. He's threshing wheat in a wine press, and the angel shows up and says, you're a mighty hero. And looking at the angel, he says, hold up, I have some questions. He doesn't expect what a being, listen to this, this is so good. He's not even accepting what a being from heaven is saying. This angel just appears and he's arguing with an angel. He's arguing. He doesn't accept what he's saying. That shows how discouraged he was. An angel from heaven has just appeared in the room and his discouragement is so high he brushes off the hero status and starts interrogating the angel. If the Lord is with us, why is all this happening? Do you see, angel, where I'm at? I'm in a wine press hiding, threshing wheat. And where are these miracles? Look at this wording. You hear him complaining. Where are these miracles? Yes, the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong and mighty hand. He did all that for our ancestors, and that's great, but big deal. Did he just bring us out of Egypt to hand us to the Midianites? Do you hear the discouragement in his voice? See, when we're discouraged, we hold the problem so close to our face that all we see is the problem. You can be God's mighty man, mighty woman, and still not see what God is doing in your life. Church folks always say God is good all the time, all the time God is good. But we may not always see it. Can I hear another amen? Amen. You can be where you're misunderstood or misunderstand God, you can be in a place where you feel weak and abandoned. And I want you to know, your low feeling doesn't make God mad at you, and your low feeling doesn't change what God has said about you. Gideon was called a mighty hero and felt defeated, insecure, and he felt absolutely positively done. And our God is so powerful, he will call us in our situation what he sees them to be instead of how they appear to us to be. So Gideon tells God that he and the people are weak and they feel abandoned and he's pouring his heart out to God. See, God knows his answers are wiser than our questions. Oh, you ought to write that down. God knows that his answers are wiser than our questions. So let's read verse 14. Let's read that. Judges chapter 6. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength I'm going to give you eventually. No, 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 he didn't say that. Go with the strength you have. Is that what it says? And rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending Pastor Jason. I'm going to send some famous preacher on television. No, he said, I am sending who? I'm sending who? I'm sending you. Can I tell you today, God's sending you. God is sending you. Don't miss this. God answers his deep discouragement by saying, go with the strength you have. Rescue Israel. He said, I am sending who? Who's he sending, church? Everybody say me. He's sending me. I need all the deeply discouraged today to listen to me right now. The things that have knocked you down, the things that have happened that have your faith hanging on by a thread, you need to know you don't have to see everything clearly to do what God has designed for you to do. That's what makes it faith. Faith is saying, oh Lord Jesus, I'm going to take a step and I sure hope you're here when I take that step. Faith is you stepping out on nothing and what God said, not what you know. Stop pointing out what you don't have because that sabotages your faith on what God wants to do 
in your life. God knows what you don't have, and God is not trying to use what you don't have. God is not saying, you get three more things, and I will use you. No, God said to Gideon, go in the strength you have. You have enough for me to deal with. Just go in what you have. Are you kidding me, God? I'm hiding in a wine press. And God says, I just need you to step out on what you have, Gideon. So what did Gideon have? So I thought about this. What, what did Gideon have? So let's talk about that for just a minute, and I'll close. Gideon had strength he didn't know. First of all, Gideon was determined. He said, my family will eat even if I have to hide and thresh wheat to make some bread. I will feed my family. So Gideon was determined. That's the first strength he had. He was determined. Another strength is Gideon was resourceful. He says, I know nobody else threshes wheat in a wine press, but that's actually going to be my strength because they're never going to come find me in a wine press threshing wheat in a wine press looking for someone processing wheat here. I'm going to use that for my strength because that's all I've got right now. The only thing I have is this wine press. I don't have a threshing floor. All I've got is all I need. It's all he needs. Come on, somebody. Well, pastor... You don't know my situation. (laughs) Well, pastor, you don't know what I've been through. Come on, church. Listen, God has already blessed you with what you need. Gideon already had everything he needed for a miracle. He only needed to be encouraged to go do it. Does anybody here besides me have people in your life that every time you tell them what God is saying to you, they say, yeah, but. I like all the yeah buts, people. (laughs) Yeah, but you know, oh, you know, you better not try that. (laughs) You know, you can't do that, Pastor Jason. Slow down, buddy. Don't you love the yeah but peoples? I got a I got a new name today. Yeah (laughs) but. I like them yeah but people. They're always working on your encouragement. I'm feeling better today. Oh, good. Let's discourage you. <laughs> you know, you can't do that. And when, by the time, y'all know the yeah, but peoples, by the time they get done with you, you feel worse than you did back when you was in the middle of your problem. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You were feeling better to the yeah, buts, got gotcha. you? It is some people's job to be the weight that slows you down. It is some people, and if you go to church, <laughs> there's a lot of weights. You can't do that. Don't you try that. Don't you buy that big old building. <laughs> Don't you merge them churches. Don't you try to do something in South Arkansas that's never been done because we got a code of conduct around here. <laughs> and church is supposed to be like this. And the pastor, he can't be gone every other week. That's never been done before. (laughs) I'm having fun, so can I just keep having fun? (laughs) I'm really, I'm serious, y'all got to laugh, but I'm seriously contemplating preaching a message called Mayberry. (laughs) I might do a series about it. On gossip in a small town. Yeah, I'm talking to you, camera. (laughs) Gossip in a small town. It'll kill you, man. I'm going to tell you, our God, He comes to an unexpected place and does unexpected things. He he, He can do exceedingly, what does Ephesians say? Exceedingly, abundantly, above what we dare to ask or think. And He don't need status quo. And He don't need Bible Belt religion. He can do something different. And He wants to do something different. But church folk love the weights. Slow us down. We love to be weighted down. Come on, church. It is some people's job to to be the weight that pulls you down. Remember, Hebrews says, watch out for those weights. Because they'll slow you down. And there are people and circumstances that will latch onto you and hold onto you like legs on a spider to slow you down and keep you from reaching the goal that God has for you. Write this down. How you feel or what they say doesn't hinder God. 
How you feel isn't what he's looking for. God has a design and a plan, and even if you're in a wine press threshing wheat, hiding from the enemy by the cover of night, you need to tell your soul what your heart should know from God. Be encouraged. God will bring it to pass somehow. He told Gideon, go in the strength you have. I want to tell you, go in the strength you have, but I I haven't heard from God, Pastor. Well, what was the last thing God told you to do? Do that. Well, he hadn't said nothing in a long time. Then I would do the last thing he told me to do. Well, it's been several years. Still do what he told you to do. You better keep doing the last thing you heard because what we do is we try to speak for God. And then that's where we get in trouble. What was the last thing you heard God say? Go with that. The last thing you heard him say, step out with what God says you have. Be encouraged that the strength you have is enough with the Lord backing you. And I ought to hear a big amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come on. Well, pastor, when I pray, I really want the angels to start singing in the sky to open and God speak in an audible voice and say, Jimmy, do this. (laughs) How many of you know God doesn't always do that? Sometimes he picks a David and sends him into a valley against the whole army because God doesn't need the odds stacked in his favor to be God. He's God all by himself. And let me tell you something else about God. God didn't get voted in. And he's not on the ballot on November 3rd. He's God. And he don't need us. He's God all by himself. And we don't vote him in. It's not a democracy, it's a theocracy. He's God. He's God. And no matter what we think, He's still God. Come on, somebody. And He can make something happen when there seems absolutely no way it could happen. Discouragement will make you only look at your problem. Discouragement just adds up things that are wrong. Discouragement tells you everything that's messed up. Discouragement will blind you from the miracles God has designed to intersect your pathway. Pastor Adam, if you would come and just play something, and I'm going to close here. As I close here, just don't, i got a few other things here I want to give you before we close completely. So I want to tell you, don't stop because you will intersect the place God has for you. Did y'all hear what I just said? Don't stop because you will intersect the place God has for you. He's able to pick you up where you are and he sees you. He sees the end from the beginning. Stay away. Listen to me. Stay away from negative people. That's negative people. Stay away from people who weigh you down. People that tell you what you can't do. Oh, you can't do it like that. Ah, uh, don't do that. Mm-mm. Ooh, don't do that. Whatever you do, don't do that. They never tell you what you can do. They only tell you what you can't do. Okay? That Mayberry message would be fun. I think we need to do that. That'd be, that needs to be a 25-week series. <laughs> 25 weeks. What do y'all think? On gossip. Weights that slow you down. Weights that slow you down. Everybody say weights that slow you down. Everybody say be on guard. Everybody say this, strip off every weight. Stay away from negative people because, listen, this is so good. I thought about this. This is so good. Stay away from negative people because they have a problem for every solution. That's right. I need to come to church more often. I'm having fun. Listen, your faith will be tested. Otherwise, it wouldn't be faith. It's faith because you don't know how it's going to work, but you believe. Listen, so we got faith. That's a little word, F-A-I-T-H, faith. That's a little catchy word. Well, there's another word, fact, F-A-C-T, fact. You got faith and you got fact. So let's talk about fact for just a second. Fact is something you add up and the sum total is this amount. Let me tell you about faith. Faith never adds up. It never will. It'll blow your mind. But yet that's how God works. What did we, we quoted the scripture a minute ago. Without faith it is impossible to please God. 
Our whole Christian foundation is based on that word faith. Faith is God's currency. I could pick up discouragement, but I won't. I could be fearful, but I'm not. Instead, I'm, instead of saying, why God, what if we said, this is so good. Instead of saying, why God, what if we said, what's next, God? Because when we start saying, why God, we stop moving. <laughs> now remember the scripture, what did it say? I mean, it's giving you, it, 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 there's this message in this, when it, it's talking, and it says, Watch out for the weights that slow you down and the sins that trip us up. It's talking about movement. It's talking about movement. Watch out for things that stop you from moving, from progressing, from going forward. And what happens is discouragement comes and we stop moving. Because we're discouraged, so we stop. We stop moving, we stop progressing. And we're asking him to come to us with an explanation. But if you say, what's next, God? You're saying, I don't want to stay here any longer. Show me where the next hill to climb is. I'm going to walk through this. Well, how's, how's it going to work out? I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows but God. If God has a plan for us, why don't we trust his plan? We all love to quote Jeremiah. Oh, I know the plans I have for you. Well, if he has a plan, why don't we trust his plan? Go in the, what did he say? What did that verse 14 say? Go in the strength you have. The strength you have. But Pastor Jay, I need more education. <laughs> I need more money. That's the big one. Oh, if I hit that lotto, that Powerball, if I hit it now, I'm going to buy that church for you. You'll be completely out of debt. Why don't you tithe? That would help a lot. Man, I really have messed up. <laughs> I, need, I need to rest again. Y'all going to run me out of town. What if we just did what we had in front of us? What if we just did what we know to do? What if we quit saying what we don't have? Well, if I had a wife or I had a husband, I would do this. What do you got right now? He says, go in the strength you have. And I'm done, but Gideon goes, I got I to gotta finish this. Gideon goes out of the wine press, and I don't have time, but I wish I did. He goes out of the wine press, and they defeat the nation of the Midianites because he went in the strength he had. Amen. Come on, heads bowed, eyes closed all over this room. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you are the encourager. And we can defeat discouragement in our life. Discouragement comes to stop us, to stop progression, to stop movement. Stop us from going to church. Stop us from reading your word. Stop us from praying. Stop us from being in community. Stop us from getting involved. It tries to isolate us and pull us apart. The ultimate goal of the enemy, still kill and destroy. He's not satisfied until he does those three things in our life. He is not satisfied until he does those three things in our life. He's coming in the back door while we're going out the front door. And he loves discouragement. And we have, according to Hebrews 12, we've got to be on guard. And we've got to strip off every weight that comes against us. And one of the big weights is discouragement. Discouragement comes to try to steal, kill, and destroy from our life. It is one of the number one killers for believers. That we get discouraged. But God, I thank you that you're an encourager. And God, we can be encouraged. Like Gideon, Father, we may be hiding, we may be running from you, but you know exactly where we are in our unexpected place. And you can find us where we are. And you can minister to us where we are. And you, and, and us like Gideon, you can use us to do mighty things because Gideon went on to defeat the Midianite army. And God, I thank you that we can defeat the enemy of discouragement in our life. Father, I pray for those in this room that are discouraged today. Those that walked in here that are discouraged. Those that are fighting battles. God, 2020 has been a discouraging year. I mean, let's be honest. This has been one of the worst years ever. COVID and all this stuff we got to do. It's just discouraging. It stops us. 
But God, I pray that today we would be encouraged, that we would be strengthened for all of those that are discouraged, that you would strengthen them, Father, right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, I give you glory, I give you honor, and I give you praise. Now, I want everybody to say this. I am encouraged that I know the encourager, and his name is Jesus. And I'm going to be encouraged, not discouraged, encouraged. And I'm going to be looking for the weights, like discouragement, that slow me down. And I'm going to be looking for the sin that wants to trip me up, to stop me from moving to what God has for me. Father, I thank you right now that I'm encouraged in Jesus' name.